Vande Matram to our most distinguished guest, Mr. Uday Arya Sir, Vice Chairperson Anjali Jaipuriya Ma'am, Esteemed Principal Pramani Chopra Ma'am, Academic Consultant Shalini Sinha Ma'am, Vice Principal Dr. Anupam Vidhyarthi Sir, Vice Principal Academics Deepa Vahi Ma'am, Headmaster Senior School Vinay Pandey Sir, Academic Coordinator Senior School Rashmi Singh Ma'am, our esteemed faculty members and dear friends. I would like to commence today's session it, with the words of Swami Vivekananda, and I quote, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others, unquote. And what is a greater act of service than what our teachers do by educating us? Today, we are delighted to host one such brilliant educator, Mr. Uday Aryaji. An alumnus of Columbia University, Sir spent 14 years in New York and Paris in various capacities in investment banking. His areas of expertise include structural finance, risk management, and value investing. Mr. Uday is also a founding partner of Blue Lotus Ventures, an initiative that invests in companies who are dedicated to make work and life better. Following his return to India in 2017, Sir now spends his time as a teacher of history and critical thought at the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education at Pondicherry. So we welcome you warmly. I wanted to start with uh, a thank you to Anjali ma'am um, and Pramini ma'am and everybody who's um, allowed for this uh, session to happen. Uh, I just want to say at the onset, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's a truly unique and um, beautiful atmosphere. Um, and uh, you're, you're quite privileged. You'll probably find out many years later how privileged, but it's a, it's a joy. Um, so this, um, the origin of this sharing is actually um, something that I, that I care deeply about. And it's about how you sort of construct your own future. A little bit of a, of a brief background, but um, crafting your own future is actually creating your own, crafting your own path to a great education. But um, honestly, this is this is I this is some of the some of the big ideas which I, I I hope I had access to when I was your age. I didn't. Um, I tried to do the best, but I ended up, you know, wasting a fair bit of time and. Um, many missed opportunities, so I'm a little wiser now, some more gray hair, so I'm uh, getting there in terms of eyes, but um, it's, a, it's a sharing which I, I, which I do care about deeply, and um, I hope that it is of some use to you, and uh, more the questions, the better. But let's start with this uh, brief intro. I am a seeker, an aspirant uh, of the yoga. Uh, formal work background, as she mentioned, uh, I spent time uh, outside India. I spent a fair bit of time outside uh, of here, and that has shaped me in, in many ways. There's a missing part, which is this, which is uh, me trying to repel society at a young age, uh, shave off all the head and all the hair, and uh, later on grow as much hair around the beard so that become uninteresting um, to people in general. But that didn't work very long because the principal actually immediately got me to shave. This was after my, between my 11th and 12th vacations. I uh, thirsted a lot to get into uh, the IITs at the time. And I spent a fair bit of time trying to uh, crack the JE at the time. And uh, that was a long and painful uh, story, but turned out well eventually. It didn't happen. Uh, JE didn't happen. I spent um, a year outside of school. Uh, in Madras, uh, in some uh, nondescript uh, lodge, uh, living by myself and working 14 hours a day. Also, it didn't work out, uh, but I was, push I was actually mad about physics at the time. So I thought, this is what I want to do in life. I want to just be in physics. And uh, that dream, uh, at that time, didn't quite materialize. But um, even the year after, so I joined, uh, I, I didn't want to join engineering because it was so against my grain at the time. Uh, so I joined um, some normal science and arts college, and um, then I realized uh, nobody wanted to study at this place, and everybody who, who didn't go into engineering was at this place. So 
So that was also uninspiring, so I quit that. So I was, I was now two years outside of school and not a part of a formal you know, schooling establishment. And so uh, eventually I got into uh, a college and then I made my way back to some normalcy in life and uh, after four years I got a chance to be at a, a place of excellence. So my original search, my original intent uh, to be outside of India was to actually try and be at a place of excellence uh, in, which I had not experienced at that time yet. And so those, was, those were my initial years at, uh, in New York and it was a very interesting life until I saw how beautiful France was. Then I moved to France for a few years. And then um, this is the last picture there is sort of my way back um, uh, with that um, funny knee chair. We were discussing a knee chair yesterday. Um, and, um, and yeah, so these some pictures with some of my uh, students. So that's the more interesting color picture version of life. And in case you, any of you love photography, I, I also love photography. I did some photography on the side. So I'm going to make some initial claims. Um, and the initial claims are like this, that a great education is very, very rarely pursued. And that second line is actually a, a line from Savitri again, that it's outside all present maps, which is why I think it's of interest to you. Why is it of interest? Um, because actually speaking, uh, all of us can pursue a, a great education. It's, been a, it's very much within our realm. But there's no standardized course. There's no A, B, C list of checklist or something. It's nothing. It's just completely unique to you. But you have to craft it. It doesn't matter whether you study engineering or medical or law. Or these are um, just uh, vocational programs. So your willpower. I think I'll emphasize the willpower a bit a lot because more than anything else, it's this that will you know, help you get there. If you have that steady resolve, you can uh, craft your own education. If you care, I'm not making the case that everybody should care for a, a great education, for a great self-education. But if you do care, then the willpower will sort of help you drive there. Uh, broad question, what is um, societally regarded as a great education? Okay, society checks to see this, right? Where you went to school, where you went to college matters. This is, if the school is storied, it's, it's uh, considered great, right? Otherwise, it's whatever. You know, they don't recognize the school. Um, if it's a big brand, again, great. And you know all the list of big brands. If you do a master's or even more than master's, PhD, okay. If in India, still, mostly, eh. Abroad means wow. And if abroad and big brand, you know what follows, right? Say la vie. But ask yourself this question. Do these brands or places imply a great education? Right? Do they imply a great education? So to answer this question, let's situate ourselves in some of the best universities in the world. OK? Here's a map. Nobody goes there in life or here. Right? Uh, there are some, this, some colors here. But you can see that in India, the best university systems in the modern age have been around for about 50 to 150 years, right? And these are, these are some of the names that are already familiar to you. In China, it's all these are mostly unpronounceable names except Wuhan, which everybody knows, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I know. I feel that. I feel your pain too. Um, and in the U.S. It's somewhere between 100 to 400 years. Okay, For 100 to 400 years is a long time to create a fantastic university system. And so you have all these very well regarded uh, institutions, um, and they are really centers of excellence. I, I would say this, it's, it's admirable, truly admirable the work they do. Then on the other side of the pond, you have these, right? Uh, in in these uh, fantastic institutions, Cambridge, L LSE, Imperial. In France, you have these names. Uh, and they have been around, interestingly, for 800 to 1,000 years. So much, much, much older than anywhere else in the world. And again, um, these are exceptional places, really, really wonderful places, um, places like this. 
right? You can imagine if this was your university's primary lecture hall, like how would you feel just being in this place? Right? It's just truly inspiring. In fact, uh, Shobindo says, uh, he moves among ancient and venerable buildings, the mere age and beauty of which are in themselves an education, undoubtedly. It's difficult to not be inspired unless you're really thick, right? Uh, you will be inspired by your surroundings. That's what great architecture is about. You try to find ways that uh, you build something which actually inspires you and affects you physically and in other ways too. What if this was the college adda, you know, just right outside? It's pretty nice. Um, or this was your corridor. Or this was your university staircase. Yeah. This is an actual university staircase. I'm not making this up. And this is not AI. Okay. <laughs> a ceiling. It's a pretty charming library space, isn't it? Uh, and you can imagine the same very space in the evenings, right? In the evenings, when it's quiet, when it gets darker, and you only have the twilight from the windows, and you have these soft lamps on, imagine the atmosphere or the environment. It's incredible. But we come back to this question. Do these places offer or create a great education? And what really is a great education? What do we mean by a great education? So I'll say this simply, just for now, and just for simplicity. Anything that nudges you closer to the innermost secrets of life. One sentence. How far would college care for this? So think about this question, regardless of where you land up two years from now. OK, you're in, we're in October, so I guess, uh, yeah, two and a half years from now, something. How far would college care for this? And do you care? So also look at this, what really happens after the 12th? Hey, voila. That's what happens after the 12th, right? Typically, by and large, the industrialized education system cares for you as a role number. That was my actual role number, by the way, a long time ago. And then you pursue these fields, which are all mutually exclusive. Right? You do this, or this, or this. What are you doing? I'm doing this. What are you studying? I'm, I'm studying law. OK, well and good. But are these fields where you pursue knowledge for its own sake? What does it mean, own sake? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. Society trains you very well over time to say this, what use is it? Ah, no, no, stop, pause, excuse me. Is it of any use? Is it of any, it's sorry. It's, it's not of use, so eh, not interesting. Can I apply it now? This is the concept of utilitarianism, right? Nothing has a right to exist unless it has tangible use to man. It's a great disease. But um, look at this. Right? I'm not saying anything negative per se, obviously, about these, because I did engineering myself. I'm the template engineering MBA, so it's like, I, I'm, it's a little, I get it. So, but they are vocational pursuits. Right? Vocational meaning this, right? skill or trade to be pursued as a career. Well and good. So these are specializations. Okay, You do one or two semesters of preparatory coursework. And then you do literally a giddy mix of 40 to 60 courses. Oops. Um, what really happens after that? Well, your seniors will tell you, but after two years, you're hunting for internships. And then you're salivating about the great inter internship that you can or you cannot get. And then third and fourth year is this. Did I get out well, which means my third and fourth year's scores were they reasonably OK for my employer to consider me as a reasonable human being or not? Maybe. But that's part of the journey, right? Who had time to think about this? And why is this question even relevant? So I will say, if you think from first principles, you know, this is something that you are already familiar with, that a nameless life is a miserable life. And you will encounter. You've probably already encountered adults who are twice your age or four times your age who don't have an aim. So if, you, if they don't have an aim and they're just doing stuff, that's okay. But in a way, it's, it's a difficult life because you don't 
you don't really go and aim for something higher. Okay, so broadly speaking, this is going to be a subject that will be discussed at length tomorrow, but for the majority, it's just this, right? Why complicate life? It's okay, huh? And this is a question that you will have to ask yourself. Are you part of the majority? And nothing wrong with being a part of the majority. Just give some clarity. And if you can be very honest with yourself, you will say, yeah, I'm a part of the majority. That's all. I, that's fine. I mean, this is good. Roti kapra makan. In fact, maybe a better version. Here's a better version, right? I want a comfortable life, good car and house, parents taken care of, children should be in good schools, should have three times rupee or whatever for... You get the idea. So if this is there, you're set. Right? But ask yourself this question then, what is original here? What's so original if everybody is doing it? Or if everybody is pursuing this, what's original about my existence? What's, how am I unique? Or really, how am I a person different from the template crowd that is doing exactly this? If everybody on Insta, for example, is doing this, how are you different? Can you be really different by shooting a picture of you skateboarding in Switzerland? Maybe. But what else? Right? In fact, do uh, look up this article if you can. It's called on Original Thinking. It's just a few pages, five or six pages. And ask this question. Does a great education have anything to do with the aim of life? Does it? Okay. Of your life, to be very specific. Because you're going to be crafting it. So reflect on these things, right? At the very, very core of our existence. Love, death, time, truth, and God. Oh, and the why of it all. Why? The why, 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 why? These are the questions for thousands and thousands of years that the most, um, you could say now in today's language, progressive individuals have pursued relentlessly and without seeking that utilitarian end that, oh, I'm, I'm seeking this question because it's going to get published and then I'm going to get famous or uh, I'm going to get um, paid a lot of money or some other random other reason. These are questions that are pursued um, truly for their own sake. And in your case, for your sake, and they are private questions, very private questions. Right? And ask yourself in the context of your college education, wherever that may be, when do we contemplate on these most fundamental questions? You have a, the rare privilege to be actually contemplating these questions as part of your school, which is why it's ex extraordinary. But the journey shouldn't stop, right? In, in college, it mostly stops. Like the institutions don't care. Institutions are a little cold, so they don't care about these things. Perhaps they should, but the question you will ask yourself, hopefully, is do I care? And if you ask who has thought and meditated on these most profound subjects, because you don't arrive at answers on these types of questions by simply thinking about them, you actually meditate on them, that's, the, that's a, probably a, a closer word, and then there's much more. But typically, people who we now know as great individuals, you can think of any number of these great individuals, but if you do care, as a natural uh, consequence, right, you would just find and read the great books by these individuals. So it's not rocket science. If this stuff matters to you, you will find and read these. I love this sentence about reading great books. It's from somebody I respect a lot. He says, uh, it's like having a conversation with great minds from past centuries. So we underappreciate that fact that these conversations can be had if you so choose. And here's just a few examples of uh, some great books and fantastic individuals. But I'll make this case that you, you can't really YouTube this. For the matter, you can't Insta this either. Right? It doesn't exist on these platforms. This is some, something that you will have to really seek out with great interest and, uh, you know, and dedication over time. But I'm going to make this case, right? Some of you have heard of this uh, or uh, may have come across idea similar to this, that a casual passing phrase can change our life. We were just talking about this right before this. Here's something that Emerson says, okay? To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. It's not so much about the quote itself, it's about the idea that 
a profound thought has been thought and shared. And even if you've not read most of the book, it's a single sentence that might change your outlook on life. A single sentence. Thoreau said this, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. Uh, this is very relevant for modern, you know, Insta signaling that goes on. That what have you exchanged for it? Here's a beautiful line from Dante, a, a poet, an Italian poet. The love that moves the sun and the stars. Where on earth did he find inspiration for saying this? Normally, in a very material context, you would say, but hey, there are gases, there's gravity, there's this, that. He's talking about something far more profound. The love, what? The love that moves the sun and the stars. It's a profoundly beautiful idea. And it's the heart of all existence. How did he arrive at this? And the point is, a single sentence like this changes your entire inner outlook. And here's another from the context of history, right? When you read history, generally speaking, it's a whole, whole series of violent revolutions and people beating each other up, black and blue. And right? here's a sentence that, uh, two sentences from, again, from Sri Aurobindo Savitri. Nothing has he learned from time and its history. An idiot R destroys what centuries made. And you can have multiple examples uh, to go over this. But another profound line, a death-bound littleness is not all we are. One sentence, right? We talked about a casual passing phrase can change our life. And the point is that great books are full of these. That's the point. We shared just maybe five or six sentences, right? But great books are full of these amazing, amazingly beautiful and profoundly impactful sentences. And that's why people actually pursue them and read them. Look at this interesting place. This is a place called St. John's College. They actually have something called a great books curriculum. Look at this. They say, this is a tradition of all students reading foundational texts of Western civilization. OK, what does that mean? Well, here I got you the example. Here's what they read in their first year, so freshman year. You're reading Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the classic poems, one of the most profoundly beautiful poems in Western civilization. In geometry or in math, they're reading directly from Euclid. We all heard of Euclid, right? Euclid's Elements, it's a classic text. It's not easy to read. It is not written as a textbook. So when it's not written as a textbook, you have to really engage with the mind of, for example, in Plato, you're reading all these works of Plato, right? The most famous of which is the Republic. Aristotle, you're reading not just his physics. So when you're engaging with these great minds from the past, the argument that the curriculum setters make is don't come down to the level of modern day textbooks which dummify things. And you know, this is, for example, a dummy's guide to life and dummy's guide to X, Y, Z, right? But go higher. Go higher and hope for the best. See what sticks. Inevitably, the people or the students who are educated under this type of um, curriculum framework are phenomenally well equipped for life because, hey, you've, you've just had conversations with the greatest minds from the past centuries, like 2,500 years ago. And um, this is what they study in their final year. So they have a, they've, they've worked out something over a four year period. But I wanted to bring this in context for you in today's day and age, what's happening? What's happening around these places, right? So let's look at a few great books and authors. So there's Franklin, there's Emerson, Thoreau, some four people. Um, in Britain, you have these great authors, Shakespeare, Milton, Eliot, Byron, the poets. The poets, in a way, define England, right? The most profoundly beautiful contribution to English literature is through, the, through their poetry. Fantastic individuals. So what about in France? You have these individuals. Um, it, in Italy, you have you know, Dante, Da Vinci, okay? In Greece, of course, there's a whole plethora of names there. And when these guys ask this question, right? When, when Americans truly ask this question, who are we? No, no, who are we? They, they don't want to necessarily say, oh, we are American. It goes beyond that. They want to identify themselves with something larger, more incredible, true, beautiful. And so it goes back to Greece. Um, similarly, in Britain, when they try and trace their intellectual tradition or that cultural heritage and the significance of where they have existed and why they are so phen phenomenal, they want to trace everything back to Greece. It's a very conscious effort. Similarly, in France, when they ask, but of course we come from Greece. 
Italy is right next to Greece, so they don't even have to make an argument. Right? There's, there's a ton of Italian uh, work which is uh, Greek-inspired. But we ask this question, are the great books studied in these countries? Right? When we're talking about great books, we're talking about, let's say, 2,000-ish years ago, those types of uh, absolutely civilization-defining great individuals. Are they studied in these countries? Uh, let's start with France. France is mostly an engineering place, uh, engineering and science. They don't really care about this. Great books, and profound ideas, and all that. Eh. Practical. Similarly, this is a decaying country. They, you, do a, you do a master's in Italian literature, very good, congratulations. Now go work at a, as a barista, right? Because it's tough. This is already decrepit. Greece is already decrepit. The best of Greek uh, youngsters have already migrated out of Greece. They've gone to Germany, they've gone to other parts of Europe. They, there's no interest in this type of stuff. Why? Why would you go and study? Uh, Britain, very little, and these uh, the most. America studies them the most. Even there, you would say that there's only about 25 places out of 3,000 plus that are actually doing anything along these lines. But you remember this, right? We just take, took a look at this, which is all these wonderful places. So most of the best universities don't really care about this question. It, they, it's not of concern to them. It's really outside all present maps. And you have to wonder if it's of interest to you, wait a second, why is it outside all present maps? Why is this idea of a great education, which is actually exploring the innermost secrets of life and existence, why is that outside all present maps? And why is it not, why is it not more fundamental? So why is it not more mainstream? Why is it left to some fringe or oh, you, OK? OK, c'est la vie, but. Um, there's still a lot to admire. Okay, so I'm not, this is not a criticism of the best universities. There's still a lot to admire about them, but they just don't do this. So if you look at these institutions, right, which are these institutions that are, in fact, pursuing these great books? Uh, by the way, they are typically offered at super exclusive uh, institutions, and they are called liberal arts colleges. Most liberal arts colleges are not super exclusive, but the ones that are exclusive do offer this type of great book uh, curriculum. Oh, contextualizing it for India, are there any institutions like this in India, liberal arts colleges in India? Any guesses? All right, excellent. It proves the point that you actually, they're not on the radar so much, and for good reason. But the answer is yes, uh, technically there are, technically there are. There are a few like this, right? Um, but I'm going to ask you another question, which is, what are the foundational texts of India? We saw a little bit about the foundational texts of Western civilization. Foundational texts, uh, or main, yeah. Pretty simple. You hit the nail on the head. Now ask this question, right? All these are, you could say, foundational texts. Uh, do any such colleges in India encourage the pursuit of any of the great books of India? Oops, you know where this is going. You know where this is going. So is this a tragic X, a tragic red X? How is this possible? How, how is it possible that you have this type of setup in India and uh, they're not? And by the way, we include, I brought back that list of generally perceived places of excellence in India as well. Oh, so let's add, okay, let's expand this now, include India on that map. Now I'm including Kalidasa, Panini, Dhammapad, etc. And many, many original works in other languages since the last thousand years, right? Since the classical languages of India started to really flourish, you've had phenomenal outpouring of beautiful literature, which is also possible to pursue as, you know, a great book. But no. Uh, by and large, no. And post-1916, which is a pivotal period, I would also make this case, the great books list which you just articulated is, is well and fair and right very much. Was post-1916, the world changed fundamentally. Like, in a way, you could say, post um, the availability of uh, Sri Aurobindo's literature in the world, it's a completely different landscape and opportunity for us. 
I will make that argument, uh, but I'll pause there. I want to just go back and look at these key ideas together. One, they don't really care about this, but it's not a surprise per se. It's not a surprise because every place knows what it wants to focus on. They know, and they're quite clear about it. Okay, this is also a bit of a oops. They don't really have a place for the foundational text of Indian civilization, which is actually, for anybody who cares, like, by the way, I've been a history teacher for a few years. I care about it. It hurts a little bit. Um, ideally, it should be a lot more prevalent. Ideally, it should be pursued uh, more significantly, but it's not. Um, vocational pursuits are important, no doubt, right? But here's a call to action. It's a short call, it's a very limited call. Ideally, you should not be losing track, if you care, right, about these most important questions. Um, what's the aim of life? Why am I here? Do I get, do I care to get to the bottom on these matters? So if you care, you should not lose track of it. If you don't care, it's, it's OK. So how do you forge your path to a great education? It's actually a very simple, straightforward thing. The first step is you commit to educating yourself. And um, this commitment is internal, private, almost secret, you might say, um, because very few people around you will care for what you're doing. Um, the system, the system around you, whether you know, parents, relatives, or I don't know, you might make another argument for whoever else might constitute a community of elders, may not really care because they may not have done it. So you will be doing something which is against the grain. And that's OK, but the commitment is internal, which is, am I really going to be pursuing an education on my own, my own self-education? derived by own, my own curiosity. And if you stay committed, you're set. Right? That's the hardest part, to stay committed throughout your formative years. Your formative years, OK, school's formative years, 11th, you finish your 12th. And then you have four years of college where you will do 40 to 60 courses of whatever subject or whatever field you might be in. Right? But during that phase, uh, to stay committed is very different than to start out as committed, right? You can start out as committed and quickly lose energy or steam and then be diluted by your interests and in other things which is not really aligned with, you know, your aspirations. It's some random bearded guy, right? So I wanted to play that at least twice to you because he might signal somebody who is committed. Right? It's, it, it's helpful to see somebody who's committed and who might actually do, might actually follow through on what he says he will do. So how do you do this, the first part? Right? How do you commit to, well, fundamentally you separate your college requirements from your pursuits. Requirements are requirements. So checklist approach, you have to satisfy those. But your pursuits are your own. They're not going to be necessarily documented. They exist only in your internal diary. And you can find these great books and authors and read relentlessly on your own, out of your own self-interest, because you are literally crafting your own path. And also because nobody else will care for you on that point. Nobody else is going to ask you, hey, wh what's all this extra time you're doing reading some random fat book? Or maybe it's not a fat book, but wh why are you reading this stuff? Dude, what, dude, what's, stay, stay level-headed, man. Just be practical. What's... So that type of argument is a, typically a very cynical argument. Again, it's a very utilitarian mindset, which is, what's the use? This what's the use question comes into play very often because it tends to dilute the most significant questions and says, you know, roti kapra makan, man, that's, 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 that's fine. So, so you have to be clear in your own mind 
and heart as to the real reason for what you're doing and whether you intend to stay committed to it or not. Because this great education stuff is not going to matter if you don't follow through with it. If you, do, if you so choose during your undergraduate years, and by the way, these are formative and beautiful years. Um, I once heard a talk, um, uh, Sridhar Vembu speak about it, Zoho. Um, you know, like how during his college years, he was bored significantly by what was happening in college. By the way, the story of a vast majority of people, uh, no surprises. But he, um, he cultivated his uh, habit very firmly to actually uh, read significantly on his own. And he pursued his curiosity, read immensely, and educated himself, literally, in the way that mattered to him, which, by the way, is what a good education is about anyway. Right? And his mental models, I would say, you know, the, the, way, the ways, the different ways you understand about the world, his mental models about so many different countries is enormous and uh, beautiful. It's, uh, it's personal to him. It's through the stories that he has read. For example, he has read significant number of stories on China's cultural revolution. What, what really happened at that time? This is different from uh, somebody telling you, today I'm going to be talking to you about China cultural revolution. Ready? One hour lecture. You're going to drone out in like 30 seconds in that lecture, right? But if you read that type of stuff on your own, it's, it's very different because now you're pursuing your curiosity. Reading relentlessly, okay, and simple stuff is to walk away from what's not interesting. It's not the case that every potentially interesting book that you pick up will actually be interesting. It might be written very poorly to you. It might not be appealing, and it may not strike a chord. You walk away. You don't have to say, oh, yeah, I picked up this book. Now I have to read it. But you do finish what is interesting. If it is interesting, why would you not finish it? Why would you not just follow through with it? Because that's part of the willpower thing. You miss willpower and you're done, right? So to accomplish anything significant, obviously a ton of willpower will be required from you, and it's all inside. So this is sort of game plan, very straightforward game plan. It's not complicated. And then you don't need to finish books, right? Before you begin on a book adventure, ask this question. What might be the key idea of this book? It's sort of like pre-reading. Okay? Pre-reading has a great number of advantages. What might be the key idea of this book? So the very, and by the way, most of the time, you will get some random set of words which will not be anywhere close to what the, the real key idea of the book is. That's OK. Right? It's the act of anticipating. If you anticipate what might be there in the book, that helps you contrast later. And that contrast is learning. The differential becomes learning. Um, OK, so the second part of this is the map. Also helpful right? to think uh, analytically about why has the author chosen these set of topics to go through. And is this, if you had to write this, or if you had to look at it afresh, and you always have the opportunity as a reader to look at things afresh, ask yourself, wait a second, I would have done this very differently, or why, why has he done this after this? Right? Again, it's pre-reading. You are not even, you haven't even opened the first chapter of the book, but it's pre-reading. And it's super helpful to actually help you decide whether this is of interest to you or not. And then you sort of get to this third and most important part, which is, you know, I'm only going to read chapters six and seven, or this section of the book, because the rest of it, eh, this is not really going to cut my interest. So you're being highly strategic in your time allocation, and that makes sense. But it has to answer to you. This seeking in any book has to answer to a certain curiosity, a certain um, desire, a certain wanting to know, and that helps you get through a lot of material. So I'm actually encouraging you to have a separate parallel life during your college life, during your college years. Um, also, in modern language, called a side hustle. Well, you already know the first part because it's vocational. By and large, what they're going to teach you is a, a very fixed curriculum with some degree of uh, artificial uh, choice introduced uh, towards the end. And by and large, it's a, it's a script. You're following a script. Somebody has set the script for you. 
you're, you're walking into that treadmill and you're, you're going to be finishing along that path. Um, and it's a very narrow scope, okay? Typically, it's an uninspiring scope as well, which means if you are actually inspired even a little bit by something higher and deeper, you will have to be you know, recognizing that during your years and pursuing that other higher and deeper on your own. You just have to create your own path. And every aspect of your uh, decision making will matter. And the most interesting part of telling you about uh, Sridhar Vembu as an example is that knowledge compounds. So again, it's a, this, um, it's a math idea that you know, when you begin compounding, most of you have done advanced math by now. You're in 11th grade. But compounding is one of the very, very non-intuitive um, uh, ideas in the world. And most human brains are actually not capable of, co of processing what compounding actually results with, or what a geometric progression really ends up with. This is similar to what happens with knowledge. It's not just a, most often compounding is, is spoken about in the context of money, investing, et cetera. But it's equally applicable, in, and perhaps even more so, harder to define in the context of knowledge and how we pursue knowledge. So in this context, the, the way that knowledge compounds uh, to you internally will not be actually apparent. After reading even maybe for two years, you will not feel any wiser, greater, better necessarily. You'll just be doing stuff. But that's the nature of compounding, that it's actually uh, building significantly below the surface. And the results, if any, come years later. So you're actually pursuing it without seeing necessarily tangible results. But knowledge compounds, and it's the most valuable compounding ever, especially if it's on higher order topics. right? So, so think about this. The value will be all beyond our limits. OK, it's not just only about reading. It's also about doing stuff. Right uh, on the side, and fun fact: all these were actually side projects. Right, all these began; these companies actually began as side projects, and there are innumerable more such examples in the Indian context also of stuff that that when you pursue something on the side, which is of great interest to you, great things can happen. Right, and if it's a, of a much higher order type of pursuit, I will even put this in front of you. So, think about this too which is many, many seekers, and not necessarily just spiritual seekers, but other types of seekers, have all been, in a sense, commit, committing adultery with whatever their profession was or life was, et cetera. One, doing one thing, but they're inmostly interested in something else, something completely different. And they pursue that, again, relentlessly, because they care. They care about it. and. It's more real than what they're actually doing. That life is more real than what they're doing. And that builds substantial um, uh, abilities and heart over time, and it creates something really beautiful. So where do you find these books? What's an example? Where might you find these books? Where do you find great and beautiful, incredible books? Do you search on Amazon bestsellers list, for example? Who will you find on Amazon's bestseller list? Any guesses? What exists on Amazon bestseller list? Or New York Times Book of the Year? If anybody cares about the New York Times or BBC Book of the Year. Where do you find these great books? And how do you find them? So it could be literally anywhere. right? But these are not boring places necessarily. I would make that case they're not boring uh, because a lot can happen. A lot of serendipity can happen. Um, collections of friends, you never know why for some bizarre reason some super interesting book is sitting on the bookshelf of somebody who you never thought would have that interesting book. It, it can happen. Um, friends, teachers, some parent you didn't expect was actually a reader or somewhere else. Basically, you keep your eye open. I keep my eye open. For example, I'm, I'm quite shameless. Whenever I go to somebody's home, I say, hello, thank you for the lemonade. By the way, can I see your bookshelf? Um, I go to the bookshelf. I spend a little bit of time there. And it's, it's just a way of remaining curious. But I would do that a lot more if I knew you know, the stuff that I'm sharing with you now. 
if I was able to do that a lot more at, at your age, that would be really wonderful. So that's one thing. And here's a bro trip. Okay, it's not a pro tip, it's a bro tip. Okay, read biographies. If you can, read many, 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 many biographies. Why? Well, um, this is just one of his beautiful sentences. Uh, the history of the world is the history of a few great men who had faith in themselves. There, are, there can be a, like uh, 500 biography type books who are written, uh, which are written with this inspiration in mind. A few great men or women, obviously, but you get the idea. And um, even in the history context, you can say, you can make the case that um, history is a series of great biographies, right? So um, fascinating personalities, many, many wonderful, fascinating personalities um, can be um, understood, uh, looked up, pursued on your own. Here's another idea. Ask your teachers, anyone you respect, for book records. What book inspired you? Why? Just tell me why. And it's an unusual question to be, it's not a question. How many of you have actually asked this question for a book record? Now maybe a little hard because you're in 11th. Maybe the book record is more strategic or what is required for 11th or 12th. But think about this when you're free. And by the way, when you go to college, you will be a lot freer because even for accomplishing these 40 to 60 courses, nobody cares. Literally nobody cares about what, what you do, how you do it, whether you do it or not, pass, fail. As long as attendance is above 80%, it's okay. So you're really super free in a sense. And then, then you, if you have that much free time, then you will have the luxury of asking this question, what am I doing with my free time? What, how strategically am I using my time? Um, it doesn't really matter where you start, which is why I don't want to see, even seed you with here is my list of wonderful, great books. I suggest you start with these. You're going to say, no, that's that guy's suggestion. I don't want us to go with that guy's suggestion. You start with your own. I'm not giving you any suggestion. But I will give you one concrete suggestion, which is this. It's a podcast. So this is not even a book suggestion. It's a podcast. Okay, it's, it's called the Founders Podcast. It's by this fellow called David Sandra. Um, so he's read like more than 300 biographies. And when I say read, he's really read. And in fact, tomorrow we'll be sharing something on you know, writing to learn, learning to write. He's really read. And his, his story is also fantastic. Comes from a broken family. Um, nothing really worked for him when he was growing up. Circumstances were pretty bad. But he decided to learn about life just through reading. Because everything around him really didn't make sense. And he built a life around it. And by the way, now he's running a podcast, which is a very, very popular podcast amongst people, again, who care. And here's a few examples. Okay. Some of you might have seen films by, by Nolan. Please uh, raise your hand if you've not seen a film by Nolan. OK, so full audience, OK. Spielberg, Coppola, George Lucas. Anyone heard of George Lucas? OK, too old, maybe. Coppola, who's seen Godfather? So in a way, you can make the case that all these guys were actually madmen, right? As filmmakers, if you try and think about their life stories, right, and you actually um, figure out why they did what they did, you will be beyond amazed at their uh, curiosity, their drive, how they got to what uh, they eventually ended up doing. It's inspiring. It's truly inspiring. And, and I'm only talking about these filmmakers as examples. Right? When you read or come to know the lives of extraordinary individuals, it's inspiring. And inspiration is an important fuel for life. So here's another set. So I'm sure you guys have heard about Kobe Bryant. right? Why is he inspira inspiring? Anyone seen the Netflix documentary, The Last Dance? Yeah? Anyone here? So Michael Jordan, why was he fantastic? Why was he at the very top of the entire athletic universe? Even today, he's regarded as somebody significant because of who he stands for as an individual. Right? And it's, it's inspiring. His life story is inspiring. But you don't get to know that life story by watching um, a 10-minute YouTube clip. That's sort of at the surface. 
you don't get to know really his struggles. They can't summarize that in 10 minutes. They can't summarize his outlook on life. And Kobe Bryant, when he was, I think, 11, uh, he had the clarity um, that he would be extraordinary in the pursuit of basketball. And at a school-going competition uh, time, one of his um, sports uh, HOD equivalents to told him, by the way, dude, the, this is like a one in a million thing. Like, literally, uh, one student out of a million, very, very, very high um, odds uh, to get through. And his response was very simple. He said, I will be that one in a million. So imagine an 11 year old child who has that self belief, as Swami Vivekananda just told you, self belief. I will do it. I will be that one in a million. I'm not concerned about the other 999,000. I'm not. I will be that one in a million. That's self belief for you, right? So when you look at these founders, or this the entire podcast is around founders, other people, Shackleton. You, anyone heard about Shackleton? Voyage to Antarctica? Yes, no, cancel? No. All right. When you hear the life story of Shackleton, you're inspired. These are inspiring, amazingly inspiring people. Uh, and, and here's a, another bunch, Napoleon, Churchill. Uh, Churchill's work, again, an individual who knew he was destined for greatness. And it, it seems alien to us who don't have maybe that feeling, I'm not destined for greatness, I don't know, other people are. This guy, throughout his life, he just keeps feeling I am going to be doing something phenomenal for my country. He just knows it. He knows it and he tells himself that over and over. He, know, he knows it for some mysterious reason. He just says, I'm going to do great things. And he has that conviction. I'm, I'm going to be fantastic. I'm going to be... Some of it might be perceived as arrogance, but he just says, I'm going to do it. And when you read his story of Churchill, and this is there, there's, um, I believe there's a podcast of... Uh, but he's done multiple podcasts on some of these individuals, by the way. He's done several on interesting personalities, and he's been able to dive deeper. But there's a podcast which is, or there's even a book that is just dedicated to Churchill before the age of 25. So we're not talking about Churchill about to fall into the grave. I'm talking about a young Churchill. What was young Churchill like? And that's when you get the seed of personality. How is this fellow so exceptional? What was his, behind his inspiration? Similarly, Benjamin Franklin and another set of <clears throat> absolutely incredible names, Edison, Tesla, the guy behind Sony, right? How many of you have seen this movie, Ford versus Ferrari? Oh yeah, most of the boys' hands have gone up. Okay, excellent, 10 points. Um, he's done podcasts on Ford, Henry Ford. He's done another one on Ferrari, okay? What was the mindset of Ferrari like, or Bugatti? These were madmen of their time, and their pursuit was abnormal. Their pursuit of excellence was abnormal in their time, and perhaps even in today's time. And it's typically these uh, outlandish, exceptional personalities that inspire a whole generation. So I'm only suggesting these as seed points to find out about people who are truly incredible. And if you so pursue, okay, some, this may not, these names may not make any sense to the men, but maybe, maybe on the women might know of something, uh, somebody by the name Estee Lauder, you know, Coco Chanel, maybe. But why were they exceptional? And how were they so phenomenal? These are incredible stories, I assure you of this. So when you have a chance to look at uh, these podcasts, maybe treat them as a starting point. Because again, the level of richness is something that you can appreciate, like when David Sandra does his podcast, let's say he speaks for one hour, one hour, 20 minutes, on uh, Napoleon, for example. You are going to get a very, very rich conversation. It's almost like a conversation. It's almost like as if he's speaking with you about one aspect or several, several aspects of Napoleon's life revealed in one biography, and then he links it to, he links it randomly to what Steve Jobs did or at some point, to what Kobe Bryant did, did he, because he's read all these founders, right? He's read all these biographies. And he's able to find that which is truly exceptional in many, many uh, of such people. And you're going to get that rich story. But obviously, that's, that's a starting point. That, that's not the whole thing. So if you're interested in a book, uh, um, that might, in, if the podcast inspires you so to actually go pursue the book uh, and, and read it, and that's a whole different layer. So then you have that, you have the kind of richness that he's able to have. So that's the final argument I will make for, you know, 
it's and a suggestion to actually pursue a great education on your own. But okay, that's it. So, questions? In your talk, you were uh, saying that if a person asks you that what is the use of the great education or the books you, you are reading, so you said that it is just completely futile to ask, that, ask those questions. So sir, what's the reason behind that? Because before uh, knowing the usage, before doing anything, I feel is quite good. It gives us such clarity that what is the use behind it, then only it will give us that discretion which is needed sure. for going. Sure, no, good, uh, good question. So just to clarify, um, the idea is to ask, why is this relevant to you? If you're going to be pursuing a great education, it requires significant time commitment on your side, right? So if it is relevant to you, it is relevant because these great questions of life are actually relevant to you. Then you don't need any further explanation. They're relevant to me, that's it. I'm interested in this, therefore I'm pursuing it. So you just keep following that path and that's the, so there's no um, other ulterior motive or utility per se, it's not, it's just I'm following my curiosity, that's it. So perhaps I think that would be the, uh, the best use of it yes. because it is able to uh, suffice our hunger, the hunger of the soul, the hunger of the consciousness yeah, exactly. which wants to evolve itself. Exactly. That's the heart of it. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, I'd like to ask you, you told us about to read uh, great books and maybe these great books are different for all the different countries. You've told us about um, France, you've told us about UK, you've told us about India also, like we have Ved, Upanishads and all. Uh, I'd like to ask you, like, for even if it, it is for other countries uh, that maybe they consider Shakespearean uh, dramas and literature as great books, would that be also relevant for other um, countries? Can it be generalized overall? It's hard to generalize, you're right. But for example, for somebody, for a, for a young British student who is inspired by Shakespeare or some other English poet, if that poetry answers to something in that person, well and good. Not all poetry is profound and sublime. Some of it is very much at the mental level. Right? Sir, because uh, as an ICSC student, as the board we are studying, we are being studying uh, Shakespearean literature from class 9th. We have studied Merchant of Venice. We are yeah. currently studying Macbeth. Yeah. And it is already really, uh, the books of the uh, ICSC course, they are already really uh, thick and they are already really voluminous to read, that we have to read such an uh, intricate explanatory uh, works of Shakespeare that needs a lot of footnotes and explanations. Yeah. So would that uh, be overpowering the uh, hobby or the activity that would encourage students to read the great books of India? I think um, an analytical pursuit of literature is very different from a personal pursuit. This is with a certain objective in mind that I have to understand this well, this text really well in a certain way because I will be quizzed on it later. That has its utility and that certainly trains the mind. But that may not give you the time to explore it simply as a piece of literature without reading the footnotes, without being quizzed by it. There are some lines in Shakespeare which just inspire you because they're beautifully written and he was gifted. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, yeah, and thanks. I mean this question in the best way possible. But you said the uh, the thinking of the society that roti kapra makan is the utility, and that is what mo the majority works for. Is there something wrong with that? And no. do you believe it is wrong? No, no, nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. That so, is required uh, and essential. Yes. Why do you go? Uh, away from that idea and why do you pursue why did you pursue the great education and not the roti kapra makan mentality see i think uh, it's a great question i think roti kapra makan mentality is the it's the herd thing so it's a herding and it's it's necessary for for society to to move on for for progress it's required everybody has to every by the way everybody doesn't have a fridge right who here doesn't have a fridge raise your hand okay there are hundreds of thousands of people who don't have a fridge in india They've never had a fridge. They should have a fridge. That's part of the roti kapra makan. That's part of development. Yes, sir. Right? So that has to happen and will happen. But ir irrespective of economic strata, there are individuals in whom there is this other hunger, other question which is going on on a parallel track, 
that flame should also have a chance. So usually the great education that you're talking about means going out of the way of our normal uh, educational curriculum. Yeah. Sir, I have seen people who, who tried to go out of the way, but they ended up uh, as college dropouts. Nobody hired them because they tried to criticize the education that we have in here. Even we often try to question our teachers that whatever you're teaching, it is of absolutely no use and will not benefit us in any sense in the future. But we never get any potential answers. So, sir, I've seen that trying to go out of the way usually ends up in getting jobless and extreme poverty. Great question. I love it. So... <laughs> Look, I think to, it, to the first part of that, for those individuals who um, question the value of the education they are receiving, I echo the sentiment uh, largely on, in some context, which is that the content knowledge or the content of what you are um, taking in into your brains for this period of, let's say, 10th, 11th, 12th, much of it will leave you over time. But that does not invalidate the purpose of doing this type of rigorous mental training. There is a value to it, and it's not the content so much. Most of the chemistry equations will go. Most of physics stuff will go. That's OK. But it's the training of the mind to be supple, to have a certain um, ability to do gymnastics, so to speak, right? a certain fluidity. These are valuable things, actually, uh, to be able to, even in the context of language, to be able to articulate a question like you just did requires a lot of training in language, right? So do you, are you going to remember lines from Shakespeare 10 years out? Of course not. It's okay. But a lot of stuff will leave you from a content point of view, but there's a certain mental training which was valuable. So I think, I hope that addresses the point about the utility of why we're studying because much of, much of the factual material will leave you. The second part of your question, which was about, um, People end up uh, becoming college dropouts. First of all, okay, college dropouts is glorified unnecessarily uh, by by media. It's not that um, people who are able to you know pursue uh, a path of their own will necessarily uh, drop out. Ideally, you should have the willpower to execute on both fronts. You know that a certain life is required unless you are absolutely berserk or you have the too much money problem like some of some families will have the too much money problem in life right key you know you have to wipe your nose with 2000 rupee bills right that's some people have that problem uh, but if you don't have the problem then you can't actually afford to drop out of college and if you can't afford to drop out uh, you have to be wondering what are you doing strategically is college um, that um, unbearable that you're able to drop out, and it's possible, like for some of you are studying, uh, I think, you know, this mental health challenge, like there might be other reasons, like a, a depression or some other psychological anxiety, et cetera. It's possible uh, for that to create issues, but by and large, I would say, you know, there's no need to drop out. For the people who do drop out, I wish them well, but no, it's really hard to come back. It's India as a conventional society, right? By and large, if you drop out, you're not going to be say you're not even going to be greeted with a hug by an employer beta to to drop out kya baat hai matlab aapne to they they will ask you what you, what are you, what were you doing if you dropped out of college now i'm not sure if you'll stick on in my company after i hired you right so being able to stick on is important so commitment in a way is valuable so i would say you know think think long and hard before dropping out <laughs> out of a college um, they will not end up as homeless and what not and by the way this is a separate, it's an aside. When you pursue a great education on the side, on your own, right, and you pursue it to the best of your own abilities, you're not going to be the same person in a year, in two years, in four years. You're not. You're going to be significantly wiser and richer with the thousands of mental models and stories that are going to be a part of you. And this is not something I will make as an economic argument, but you will be infinitely more hireable, by the way, having pursued a great education. Because in a, in a sense, good employers know thoughtful people from not so thoughtful people. Right? Good employers know who is meant to be doing clerkish stuff versus not so clerkish stuff. So what distinguishes these things? Nothing, by the way, I have nothing wrong with, I'm, 
perfectly fine doing clerk stuff myself. But I'm saying uh, one has to know what one's capacity is and then you know leave the rest to whatever happens after. But don't drop out. So. <laughs> Sir, one of Sri Aurobindo's quotes that you mentioned was to commit adultery with God is the perfect experience for which this world was created. Sir, could you please elaborate on how this relates with the aim of getting a great education? Sir, since this quote has really resonated with me, but I failed to contextualize what it really means. Okay, so it's an, you could consider it a good question. It's considered, I included it as an analogy, um, in the sense of uh, pursuing something which is of great interest to you, um, will often happen outside of what is conventionally and systematically being done. College, whether you do law or medicine or whatever else. So if you're, going to, if you're going to be doing it, you're going to be, it's literally going to be like that something or some, someone else that you're seeing on the side, in this case it's a great education which you're trying to craft on your own, and hence the analogy with that uh, quote, which, which is a separately profound quote for other reasons, which is, it's touching on um, very often, uh, even the spiritual pursuit happens in a context of adultery. Okay, I'm not meaning adultery in the context of sleeping around randomly with some other people. I'm just talking about adultery in the sense of uh, a pers an inner pursuit also happens sometimes even within a marriage, right? Uh, either the woman or the man is pursuing something far higher and deeper than what is, you know, what the conventional aim of life is, and it's being done on the sly outside of that marriage institution. So that's actually, in a way, you could say it's adultery, but that's, that's why it, that provocative quote from uh, Sri Aurobindo. So the question of uh, that student was regarding adultery with God. So what Sri Aurobindo is trying to say is that while you're doing whatever work you're doing for anything, whether it's your education or roti kapra or makan, on the side, you're having a relationship which is not part of your main work, but it is a on the side, it's something on the sly, you're having a relationship, you're building a relationship with God. And for that, you're finding out, you're searching, you have a quest, you want to know more about God, and <laughs> you pursue all kinds of fields to find God within you, outside you. That's what the quote meant. <laughs> Mirabai is an example for that. First of all, what I believe is the word great is quite overused and misunderstood. And what I saw today was one of the best uses of the word great, linking this to the great education. And uh, coming up to my question was, how do we impart this great education to the youth of Bharat? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a tough question, uh, very tough question. I think that question is central to what is being attempted here, right, at the school. It's a very tough question and very in, even harder to put into practice. So, because most models of education fail uh, because they become sort of um, non-exploratory. Non so they become lectures, that like there are actually lectures that are done in many institutes in India which are, um, very, uh, very dry, uh, because this, these questions have to answer something deeper in, in the youth of Bharat, and the youth of Bharat is very, very capable, uh, across the country, very, very capable. And so um, it's hard to craft a system of education which caters to this, but I don't know of, um, I don't know. I don't know what is a good enough answer to that. That's why it's not a it's not a great idea necessarily to um, try and systematize most of this because if there is a curiosity, if there is this hunger or drive or in this somewhat uh, this this fire that is not extinguished, um, it will find its way. Like most for most people, I've seen at least that if they're sort of even a borderline conscious of this, you know, inner flame, they it will not go out. It, they will make sure it's alive and might take a little longer, might take a while for it to manifest, but for many, and here's the other flip side, right, to her question about the roti kapramakan. 
for many, it's just, it's just not there or it's dormant. It's just never been awakened, which is fine also. So I'll be making, I, I don't want to go into the possibility, should we go and light a fire? I don't know. I think what is best is natural. So if it comes out in a natural curiosity and you have a drive for it, why not? Uh, just adding to your and Ishan's answer, sir, uh, I do agree that it would be illogical to systemize this approach to a great education because in, uh, at the end, ultimately, it corresponds to our individuality and what interests us, and a systemization would not lead to that. Correct. But at the best, what we can do is provide resources. We are fortunate enough to study here where we have yeah. a library that has many such great books, but at the grassroots level, uh, in villages, in schools, government-sponsored schools, I think these resources and opportunities to avail this great education at an individual level should be available yeah. because it can't be done at a massive scale or at a governmental level because the current aim of the Indian economy is not this. It's just to aid people to get jobs through education. Correct. No, I fully agree with you. I mean, I'm very much on that same page that more resources should come around and I, I believe they will come around. One uh, interesting contrast for me, you know, when, uh, just moving across countries, is that uh, in India, at present, we don't have as much of a love and appreciation for the value of libraries as we perhaps could or should. Uh, and um, there may be a variation across the cities of India, I don't know, but where libraries exist, they are hardly visited. And um, in contrast, this is not a criticism, okay? This is, I'm not uh, saying some, something you know, negative uh, necessarily, but in contrast, in, for example, uh, living in uh, New York City or Paris, the, the availability of uh, these types of resources was a lot more, so ubiquitous, literally. And culturally, everybody that I knew of, at least, was perfectly fine actually borrowing, going and engaging in these places, spending time in these places. So they became resource centers, they became, in a way, community centers. Same thing happened in Paris. When you create good environments, people come. It's like that baseball movie, you know, in a field of gold, I think. It's, when you create the environment, people come. So and maybe their libraries, as of now, aren't there yet. Maybe a time will come when they will become beautiful and inspiring, and people will want to actually spend time there. But uh, that also reflects, you know, the stage of progress. So there's an evolutionary stage of progress. Some, Societies are more economically advanced than ours, and that's fine. So they are able to do that much more easily. Uh, for us, it will take a little longer, but we're getting there. But simultaneously, there's a, there's a lot of good sign of hope, of good change happening, uh, irrespective of these systems. So these systems, so we don't have to have a top-down approach. We can have a you know, bottoms-up approach also, which works equally well. Yeah. Sir, my question to you is, you told us in your speech that uh, what requires to get a, good, uh, a great education is the will. Everyone has the bill, will in the, in the beginning, but uh, eventually it fades away. So how do we keep the will burning? How do we keep it uh, alive? A lot of what you actually accomplish will depend on the kind of habits and practices that you put into yourself into your adult life. So now you're 16, 17. Um, the habits that you put in place now will help you get to where you are at the age of 20. And if you don't have certain fundamental reflective habits, it's difficult because then habits stick with you. So one reflective habit is to simply check on yourself like literally every week, uh, like maintain a diary, some sort of uh, personal note where you're actually observing yourself. If you, give your ch if you give yourself a chance to observe yourself, you will see what is required. And you will, if you're ruthless with your own observation, and if you're very, very self-critical, it will help because you will see that I'm clearly not where I should be. I, I, I did X, Y, Z things that, I, that were not reflective of where I'm aiming to be, and you will fix it. But you have to create and cultivate the time for self-reflection. School will not do, do it for you. College will for sure not do it for you. Here, at least, there is some sort of there's an infrastructure to encourage this development. But finally, it's up to you to put in that sort of uh, reflective habit in place that allows for that. Then you develop your will. That's the most important muscle in the body, in a way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <clears throat>
Thank you. Sir, you talked about the great education, and I too would like to become a part of it. Sir, but at present, you yourself uh, are, uh, is, a, is a history teacher. So, sir, how do you contribute to uh, this great education? How is your way of teaching different, and how is your syllabus different? of teaching the history so that, as you uh, yourself said, that history is just a series of wars that we study. So, the, so, the, so, sir, I ask you, sir, how is your history different so it contributes to the inner development of the children? Okay, that's a very profound question. I think that's, that's, we'll leave that for a, we'll leave the, the larger part of that question for an aside on how is my teaching of history different. I think if you're able to um, give yourself that uh, commitment, then, you're on your set. That's really it. And on, on history, I understand again from 11th and 12th. By the way, I also went through IS, ICSE and ISC, so I'm very familiar with at least back then how, how um, at least for me at the time, history was not a subject of interest. It was. Sir, I am a history student. Okay, very good. <laughs> good for you. So, no, I'm, I'm happy. I'm. Um, You'll have to find, like, even in the context of history, right? If you, if you're curious enough about history, you will find uh, these great books, great works on your own. And I'm happy to help, of of course. Um, but you, you'll you'll find, and then um, the point is that um, that sharing which you um, will be capable of at that point will help ignite more and more to a genuine pursuit of uh, what matters. And again, your discrimination will come in place at, at a certain point, right? Like, are you studying history from an academic angle? Are you studying history from uh, the evolutionary perspective? Uh, are you studying it to uh, become uh, a professor? Or what's the real point about history? Are you studying it simply because you're curious? So uh, Toynbee, who made some of the biggest uh, or most well-regarded history books, was a madman about history. He just pursued it because he uh, was infinitely curious. And that's sort of the drive which creates excellence, right? If, you're, if you have that sort of insatiable, I'm not doing this for, an, for a master's thesis or a PhD thesis. Those, typically, those outcomes don't go very far because they come within a framework of a system, right? But if there is a curiosity as a history student to pursue it simply because it's of interest to you, then the sky's the limit, really. Where, you, where that lands you up with, who knows, right? It can be very, very significant. Thank you, sir. Sir, do you think uh, one of the problems nobody has brought great education to India is that people has ad uh, adapted to the situations. Like people, uh, many people of India adapt to negative situations, uh, many. So do you think the education that is being followed right now, people has adapted to it, therefore the um, great education is still to come to India? So we have a problem. <laughs> I think those universities which uh, I had mentioned, right? Largely the problem of uh, humanities in India is that it is not a very original field. You know, the great education comes under the umbrella of the humanities or liberal arts and it's not very original. And the reason I say that is most of the teachers or professors of these subjects in India are actually America returned. Mm -hmm. So they're NRIs with a heavy accents, right, right. okay? And, and most importantly, beyond the accent, they actually have imbibed a certain way of thinking which is heavily Western. So when you study uh, for a long period of time, a certain vocabulary enters you, a certain way of thinking enters you, right. it becomes very misaligned with what we know here. So even, for example, I won't name the school, but there is a school that studies, a, a university that studies uh, the Mahabharat. Okay? In some context, it studies it. But their study of it is, um, it will bring tears to the eyes of anybody who is, is familiar with the poem. Because it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a lens that is uh, alien to ours. So I think the bigger problem of why this type of great education has not come yet is we haven't done enough original thinking. And we have not asked ourselves these questions of, what is, what is unique to us, uh, how, like for example, what is the dharmic perspective? What, is, what does it mean, uh, what does this word dharma mean? There's no rule book, there's no code book, there's no wiki page, I mean there is a wiki page but that it's just jarring. Um, so if you don't, you know, in the Indian context, there are 
th thousands of stories which will help you arrive at some nuanced idea of what dharma is. But it's hard to explain it in a single sentence to somebody who is not in our tradition, right? So that's why, in a sense, what you need perhaps for bringing a great education in our, in our university systems is uh, a series of practitioners, meaning not academics necessarily, or perhaps they could be both. But you need people who are very well versed with the academic aspects of, edu of you know, what is required to be imparted or required to be studied. That is important. But you also need practitioners, meaning you need people who are um, not alien to the tradition, are rooted in our tradition, understand what it means to pursue when you're studying um, uh, the Gita, for example, what does it really, how does it relate to um, life itself? You, these central questions, you cannot, you cannot have an academic answer to. So you have to be a practitioner. But uh, sir, uh, like, how can we change that old idea of the people? So we can't, we can't change that old idea of the people. Then it's, how can we bring great education to India? You have to do it, no. You and I have to do it, or you guys have to do it. Correct. So okay. basically, anyway, um, I think this was a brutal quote. Okay, so this quote says, um, science advances one funeral at a time. Mm. And it's very cold, because it's actually suggesting to you, and by the way, this is one of the foremost physicists of the 20th century, right? He's telling you that amongst a community of scientists, it is next to impossible to get something new and fresh out. It's impossible. And these are supposedly the best evolved minds, intellectually capable minds, because there's a certain rigidity that comes in and says, I will not accept. And so he said it. Science advances one funeral at a time, literally implying we need for a generation to pass, then there's hope. So I don't want to be that cold, but per se, you know, if you have, like, forget about changing minds of others, you focus on what we can, we can focus on what is within our grasp and hand is having that sense of what is possible and then contributing towards it. OK, OK, thank you. So can I just? Uh tell a short story. Yeah. So there was a young child, four, three, four years old, and in a cold country, and he used to see his fa grandfather sitting by the fireside, reading and reading and reading all day through. And till late, we hours in the morning. When he'd get up in the morning, he'd see his grandfather reading. When he'd go to sleep, he'd find his grandfather reading. So he was very inspired. And he asked his grandfather that, uh, I also want to be like you, so you give me some reading material. A three, four-year-old child. And his grandfather gave him the age-appropriate books. As he grew older, more reading, so J.K. Rowling, da da, -da mm. went on. When he was maybe seven, eight years old, he was given the Ramayana, kids Ramayana, the Mahabharat. Then he went on to study Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. And uh, when he reached college, he asked his grandfather one day, he said, Grandpa, I've uh, been reading and reading and reading like you for so long, through school, through college. But I don't see any change in me. I don't see what is it given to me. So his grandfather said, I'll answer that question. You just do me a favor. This little basket which has coal, you know, so you just drop the coal and you get water in it from the river nearby. And the child said, getting water in a basket. He said, just listen to me and get water. So he ran to the river, he got water. By the time he came, the water had dripped out. And the grandfather made him run again and again and again, some four times. Then he said, look, Dadaji, I'm not doing this anymore. Why are you making me do this effort which is not going to bear any fruit? He said, look at the basket. So he said, do you see something? And he looked at the basket and he said, yeah, the basket was black with the coal. And now it's squeaky clean, it's shiny. So he said, this is what the great books have done to you. Since you were a kid till now, you've just been reading and reading. And the light that is inside you, that light is shining out from your whole persona. Your being has changed because of these great books that you've read. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. My warm greetings to everyone. Respected Anjali ma'am, Pramani ma'am, Sharani Sina ma'am, and our dearest guest for today.
Sir, your session was indeed sublime. Your originality, articulation, clarity, resonance with the students, and of course, your sense of humor made this session a delight. So it is really admirable that you chose the noble profession of teaching, and you chose to opt out of the rat race and outside the present maps, as you said, to impart this great education to the youth of today. That is extremely admirable. And so you told us that even in the most profound universities of the world, the best universities, the most magnificent corners of the world, no one can make us extraordinary. It is our choice. I think that is the most profound truth of life. And the earlier we know it, the better. That there is no life partner in our life that is someone else. We are our own life partners. So the moment we are very comfortable with ourselves and the moment that we strive to walk on the path to excellence with our own selves, I think that is the point where our lives change. So you are definitely the epitome of coolness with spirituality. So like how everyone thinks that spirituality is boring, it's not. You can also be cool and be spiritual at the same time. Thank you for teaching us that. We learned that family, career, job, all these things are important, but they are the accessories, the mere accessories of life. The most valuable thing in life is life itself. When we try to learn about, learn about life, as Anjali Ma'am often says, to ask the question, who am I? That is a very deep question. Because that's when you're actually trying to be more than who you are. Sir also told us to read books. And I have often seen this in most successful people of the world. All of them read books. The multimillionaires, they say that one idea in the book is worth a million dollars. When we ask this question, who am I, when we read profound books, we blossom and flower our own lives. With every 86,400 seconds of the day, we should always try to realize how we can use those 86,400 seconds of the day as money. Time is money. So at every point of time, we learned how to utilize to become the best versions of ourselves. Lastly, I would just like to say that the capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. And the willingness to learn is a choice. No one will come and tell us to become better versions of ourselves. It is our own bold step. So today, if you feel like scrolling through Instagram or watching YouTube shorts, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you choose to be an extraordinary person at any point of your life, just know you cannot be extra extraordinary by being a part of the herd. If you want to be extraordinary, you have to opt out of the rat race. So rather than scrolling, why not pick up a book and see how it feels? If it feels good to you, then stick to it. If it doesn't, then it's fine. There's nothing wrong with being ordinary. But if you want to be extraordinary, then be bold. Sadhguru also said that the great aim of education is intelligence plus character. So I'm sure, sir, that your session has instilled in us the quality of character, which is the most crucial part of our school as well, that we impart character in our beings. So thank you so much, sir, for that delightful session.